I want to start off by going back to April 2020 or April last year. Before 322 or what is known as Bulla Bulla was purchased by NCV Enterprises. On the 27th of April, Max Egan uploaded this video. Now he uploaded it at the time, April last year, his YouTube channel was still, um, well it hadn't been closed down and this video was readily available and had thousands of views on it. Now he's done this video here in response to this one that he did earlier in April. Here where he's doing this at the Crow House with Mark McMurtry here and he's introducing NICAP on Minjimbal and the sovereignty issues around the OSTF and he also mentions in here that Mark McMurtry is the chosen one and it's like well there are others actually considering themselves the chosen one and it's making it a little bit hard because it's in the name one there can only be one and there's more than one so there's and strangely enough they all seem to be males making that claim too like that I think that's pretty gender bias when they think that the chosen one only can be a man but anyway back to this video at the end of April that Max Egan uploaded here he's actually driven down from Queensland to New South Wales onto the land here this is Scott's Lookout and that's located on the 16 lots that are owned by Zimmerland and Peter Van Leishout that NCV Enterprises are attempting to purchase. Now because of this first video that Max did and he'll tell you in this video because of the response that flooded his email of people that were interested in this project how do they get involved how do they invest and also bringing up some of the issues that they've heard things about and that they want clarified. So Max Egan is here this day. There's Adrian Brennock in the background there and I'll just let this play a bit it's on mute and he's giving a bit of a spiel about the countryside how it's beautiful and everything like that. Now the reason that I'm bringing this up is because this was a very public video it was also done with this specific purpose as Max Egan states in the video in response to potential people that would buy in they wanted to know more about the project. So in the descriptions in this video the promises advertised statements made by Adrian Brennock who just got himself out of picture there because he's shy and Adrian um, Mark McMurtry here both the developers of Nightcap talking about Nightcap there are certain statements made and one of those statements that aired publicly in April 2020 is that the development would have 28 kilometers of sealed roads 28 kilometers at a million dollars per kilometer that any car could drive on and that was an ongoing promise and an expectation up until the point when the DA was lodged when the DA was lodged there is no sealed roads it's unsealed it's now 26 and a half kilometers and it's 18 and a half million now a big part of this and what of this promotion over here Max Egan is saying well you need the 28,000 to build the roads so that you can build all the other stuff and he's yeah 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 so the big push is to get people in on the ground level to get 28 million dollars together to tar the roads and then of course there's also other representations and promises made of what you can expect if you buy into Nightcap on Minjimble. 
Now, this is done before they've actually purchased back uh, 3222 through NCV Enterprises. Mark McMurtry here, standing on Peter Van Leishout's land, has been living in the very house that past lost investors got evicted from and the land since they got evicted. He has been caretaker and lived there rent free. And he makes reference to it over in this video where he points behind him over there. He said that this here has got nothing to do with that. And it's like, well, Mark McMurtry, you are wrong. Even after, still now, Mark McMurtry lives at 3222. After it's been purchased by NCV Enterprises, before it was purchased by NCV Enterprises, when it was part of Bulla Bulla, it's always been part of Bulla Bulla. It's just that ownership changed to NCV Enterprises, who is still Adrian Brennock. And Adrian Brennock did, as part of their official video, do a video standing out the front, bragging with Mark McMurtry here, we bought it back. We bought it back, as indicated in the Voxes that Adrian Brennock would put the company into liquidation, sell off the asset, get rid of the dead wood and take everything that he's setting up and move next door with it. Prior to that happening, the negotiations with Peter Van Leishout were looking at expanding on what was already there in Bulla Bulla. But with the past lost investors causing a, a little bit of a stink by asking questions, they decided, no, we're going to pull the commercial away out from underneath them as well. And no, they can't be part of the Peter Van Leishout deal. We're going to go over there, set it up, and we'll buy back Bulla Bulla and uh, make it part of the development still. It's never been excluded from the development. It's always been part of it. Even as Wollumbin Horizons representing Bulla Bulla, it has still been part of, well, Planet have got it in their documents. Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited is the company that's controlling the land asset. And if that isn't tying them in, there's plenty of other things too. But back to the unsealed roads as to the advertised promise back in April 2020. And most of the people that actually bought in in 2020 bought in after this video and well the good chances are that they have seen the video because they gave links to these out as promotional um, links in emails they sent as well so that you can as a potential investor watch and see what you can get 28 million 28 kilometers of sealed roads that any car can drive along now that's a promise as far as I'm concerned, an advertised representation of if you buy into this, what you will get. Sealed roads that any car can drive on. That's a big issue because, well, unsealed roads in the terrain it is, in summertime especially, you're going to have so many problems. There already are problems in the Voxes. Uh, accessing Bulla Bulla. The other lots with Peter Van Leishout are not necessarily any better because they're going up and down and these are tracks. They are not roads. So this that they're putting in is going to widen the roads from two metres to six metres and all it's going to do is put in an unsealed road that will get seasonally washed out, that will need to be regraded in so many areas, uh, up hills, at the bottom of hills, and maybe where all of what's washed from up down needs to be regraded too because there's too much build up, it's too soft, and people are slipping in it because it's getting thick and soft. But on the flip side of it, you've got it's wet, slippery and dangerous that you have got car accidents waiting to happen. And the fact that some of these could be off the side of a cliff 
um, you might not, you know, get stopped because you hit a tree and all you broke was your car. You might not have a tree to stop you. You might end up, yeah, that's a long drop. So that's one question I'd actually like nightcap developers to actually answer. Is why over here it's promised and endorsed by the presence of Adrian Brennock who... Mark McMurtry is constantly referring backwards and forwards and if he doesn't have anything correct Adrian Brennock will correct him so that they are representing what they consider to be the facts. So here they're intending we are going to do 28 kilometres of sealed roads that anyone can drive in on. Over here what they have actually delivered on is 26 and a half kilometers of unsealed roads that will annually cost to regrade that is dangerous for people to drive on and not all cars will be able to access those roads all year round. There are times you will need a four wheel drive and there will be times even in flooding that it doesn't matter if you've got a four wheel drive, you're not crossing the bridge. So if you look at the advertised promise of 28 million, this component here should have been 28 million. And these other unnecessary components could also be made up with the 5.4 million that they've now said that they want to spend in on the bridges. So considering that that would have been 28, 718, and 5.4 for the bridges and then you go down here the laying of the cables that's still 1 point well 2.5 million total there so all up it still would have been more than 30,000 so why didn't they just put in that correct costing to begin with why change it from sealed roads to unsealed and then try and pad it out with all these other things that they say that they want the money for. It's very specific in this video. They want 28 million for the roads, to tar the roads. 1 million for each kilometre of road. That's stated out of his mouth, the developer of Nightcap. So I might be as bold as to say that in April 2020, what was advertised by the developers of Nightcap on Minjimbal ended up to not coming to any fruition at all. There is no sealed roads other than what was required in a few patches, which is roughly around 700 metres in different locations purely because they have to do those sealed parts because it is too steep and emergency vehicles have to have that part sealed. So they haven't sealed it to make it easier for people to get in and out only because they had to. So if they had just stuck to the 28 million for what they said and advertised April 2020, then the costings wouldn't have been an issue and it could not be said that they did not live up to their advertised promise. Their advertised promise was 28 kilometres of sealed road that any car can drive along. People bought in on that promise. Now I'm going to have a why I've gone into the costings here is because from what has come out with the planning meeting that agenda that is going to occur on the 1st of July at the Tweed Shire Council is according to the report there is one of two options. The council is going to question the revised civil costings or they will just recommend it onto the Northern Regional Planning Panel for uh, determining the DA. And they have actually said 
the recommendation is to refer it on to the Northern Regional Planning Panel. There are several reasons why after questioning them once on the civil costings that when they come back there is still cause to look at what they've presented and say, um, I'm sorry but I think you need to revise these too. So rather than push it backwards and forwards between authorising bodies, considering the body of the development application itself has failed in so many areas to be compliant with any of the legislation it's required to be compliant with, that the authorising body cannot grant approval if it does not meet certain legal requirements or it breaches certain conditions. So it is pointless to drag out who says no to it, essentially, uh, because they got the costings wrong. They would have to be amended along with multiple other issues for it even to be contemplated, to be accepted, to look be looked at for approval. In its current state, there are so many breaches within it, and these breaches are not the imaginations of people. They are actually the advice of legal counsel and comparing the laws that are needed to be followed in relation to whether the DA is actually doing it or not, like not building over a wildlife corridor and all the other things that, well, I've already raised most of the issues that are in this report. So there's really not too much new in here that was not anticipated. A recent newspaper article, uh, today I think, said that there are 10 reasons why DA approval will not be given to Pete Evans' nightcap. And of course they always refer to Pete Evans in the news media, don't they? But um, 10 reasons, there's your 10. And it all is in fact with the fact of all the issues that have been raised previously, undue harm, a breach of cap uh, on population density, uh, development of each lot relies on development of other lots, it's supposed to be a single lot, and up here it's supposed to be a single lot. And as you go through, and there's these 10 itemised, then it goes further into it. It's actually a 23-page report. There are some things that came back from various departments about the assessment under certain conditions. The flora and fauna one was not very good at all, I'm afraid. There were so many things that did not meet um, even with what they provided. There was not enough uh, surveying done, not, a, not enough area, extensive, and all of these other things. I mean, you can read this document for yourself and find out. But the heritage area too, that uh, assessment needs to be done uh, as an archaeological site to see there's only, it's only been looked at initially once to see what's there and it has not been explored fully. So before any development can go ahead, the architectural, uh, architectural, the archaeological survey has to be done on the land itself to see whether it would actually impact on any heritage areas. And that alone could take years to do. But what I am more interested in actually looking at here is the actual costings, because it is not within the best interests of anyone concerned for it to be dragged out and argue backwards and forwards over which authority is the consenting authority. It's basically this needs to go through and ultimately 
the Northern Regional Planning Panel cannot give it consent. It is clearly stated in the State Environmental Planning Policy that if certain conditions are not met or breached, that the consenting authority cannot give approval. So whether it's Council or the Northern Regional Planning Panel, they can't give approval for the things that are not in line with the State Environmental Planning Policy. So to question the costings is only going to delay the inevitable. Well, that's my estimation. I certainly don't want to make the decision for Council, but it is very confident that that's what's going to happen. It'll end up back in the Northern Regional Planning Panel's hands and they will look at all the recommendations in all the areas and understand too that um, they cannot give it approval because it is breaching too many of the legal requirements to give approval to. But the costing itself, they've bumped it up to 39.8. See here, estimated capital investment value. This is the front page of the nine pages that they sent through. So what you're thinking now is that the estimated total cost is 39.8 million. Well, I'll just get you to the bottom line here and tell you that it's only 27.9. Now, why is it 27.9? Well, let's go back up here to the beginning again and start here. 27.9 is part of this 31, 000, uh, 31 million here. Now we've got 15% contingency here. Then it would seem we've got more contingencies for professional fees allowance of 3.5 million. So that's what, over 8 million in contingency fees. Because these professional fees allowances, I can't see what you need three and a half million professional fees allowances for. This is a civil construction. Why do you need professional fees? Is this what you would say it costs to bring the DA into compliance? 3.5 million? Is the professional that you're thinking of paying planet, the town planner, to organize those changes so that you can try and get it compliant? Who are those professional fees for? And in paying those professional fees of 3.5 million, does that actually achieve, is that part of the civil construction cost of stage one? Or is this three and a half professional fees part of what is ongoing costs to finish the project that would take stage two and after. So is this a projected future cost or what? But let's go a little bit further down to what they say it's all made up of. You got a couple of pretty pages with nothing on it and we get down to a bit of a summary on what they included and what they excluded. And of course 5.4 million for the bridges has now been added and the street lighting 1.8 which now will also mean changes to the visual assessment and also the impact on tourism that that visual impact would have because it'll now, well what are they saying I think there's about 125 street lights that they want to s stick in and that area where they'd stick in all those street lights is actually if you go to surrounding lookouts and look on a nice dark night and you want to enjoy whether it's the full moon or you know the night full of stars you've got this horrible lit up spot probably look like a big mining camp or something like that it's got that many bright lights going on everywhere because there'd be all those street lights and 392 houses with at least one light on, there'd be at least some of them that will have a spotlight on all night because they're too scared to be in the dark. So yes, yeah, light pol pollution, visual impact, 
It's completely unacceptable that you would, all that would create that whole darkened mountain and bush into light pollution and light haze. And it would dull the night sky as well. People don't move to the country to see light haze. They actually love the dark, the dark nights where you can look out into the stars and not see street lights and all that other rubbish everywhere. That's why they don't want this development there either, because you're setting up suburbia in the country. But anyway, we'll go down to the summary. So this is a little bit of summary that it goes in. There's your 27.9. It covers all those things. But that's the actual cost, the civil construction's cost. That's what they say it's going to cost, 27.9. But now they're going to add margins and adjustments. So the margins and adjustments, 1.5%, 0.6%, and 8.5%. So we've got quite a few million here that have now conveniently pushed that up to 31 million. So now it's over 30 million, and it's still the estimated construction cost, even though it's got contingency built into it. Oh, but hang on. Now they're applying 15% contingency at 4.6 million. So, wow, that's a lot of contingencies. And then you look down here at the professional fees allowance contingency of 9.6%. And it's like, oh, so your 27.9 million that it's supposed to cost to put in these unsealed dangerous roads and your street lights and your bridges, if you add in all these margins and adjustments and anticipated costs that might go out over the whole project, it's now up to 39.8 million. So as you can see, it was just going to be another argument with the proponent over the costings. They didn't get it right in here. This shows complete and utter lack of professionalism and not knowing what you're actually costing up. This is costing of construction of housing. This is not uh, the stage one roads work even if it was something that they were going to do, even if they were going to put in 392 sewer treatment plants and rainwater tanks and supply all the solar panels, it's still not part of stage one. That would come right at the end. So at no stage could it be said that these things were part of stage one cost. Now, when they were pulled up on that cost, then they go, well, hang on, we put costs in there that, well, they've never been our costs, but we also forgot to put other things that we should have put in there, like we should have put in the bridges, we forgot to put the street lights, and we, oh, look, we underestimated this, and then we underestimated that, so we're going to put all that up a little bit more now, and we're going to have a 15% contingency on the whole project, but we're also going to have other margins and contingencies, so that will pad it out to 31 million. Overall, 39 million. So the reason that they couldn't actually make the roads sealed in the DA is because, you see, in the video, it's only an unfulfilled promise. You know, from their perspective, well, tough, we changed our mind. You know, if 20 people bought in on the promise of sealed roads and an ordinary car access, well, not so tough really, is it? Because it's part of the marketing, part of the sales. And you did not provide what you marketed. There is no sealed roads in this development application. And if you did, you would actually have to fork over 28 million. Now, considering that the whole project now with everything else that you've been able to put in there doesn't even come to 28 million, one would say that 
if you put in the true cost of sealed roads in there, of what you marketed and represented would be the benefit to people if they bought in, then none of these costings would have been an issue. It would have been over 30 million. But I suppose the issue is that at the end of the day, you have to deliver on this, not on the promise that you made in a video, but on this that's in writing. Now, if you'd put in there that you were going to put in 28 kilometres of sealed road at 28 million, they'd have to put in 28 kilometres of sealed road. They can get away with unsealed roads now at lesser cost. And even though it is a failure of the marketing promise, they're not actually going to be fussed about it because they'll just sue anyone that says it's a failure of marketing promise. And, uh, well, if you happen to be part of the community and you, you say that, you'd get kicked out. And if you don't think that's the case, you've got the same people running this development, which is the expansion of the first development. And if you actually needed it confirmed, Adrian Bronock says on the Voxes himself that here we are, we've just tipped over the first one into liquidation and we're selling the second one on stage. Don't know how we're going to do that. That's, that's out of his own mouth. That's... That's a confession <laughs> that they are associated and also the confession that he intends to do exactly what was done. Well, Lumber Horizons was put into liquidation. It was purchased back by a member company that he is actually a shareholder in. An illegitimate shareholder, albeit, simply because Nyepi that holds the shares, well, he put that company into his wife's name when he went bankrupt, so it wouldn't be seized in bankruptcy. And it's Nyepi Proprietary Limited that holds all the shares and interests in Nightcap. Another interesting point too is that his job description is only supposed to be a sales rep or an employee. He's earning a wage for what he's doing. Well, I don't know whether that kind of a description comes to mind when you're thinking of developers. Usually a developer has a financial interest and a vested control in what's going on. And even though Adrian Brennock's bankruptcy trustee would say he's only an employee, I'd say, Jason Bettles, you don't have a clue. How many developers have you actually spoken to that are only employees that aren't financially invested and don't have a say in the outcome of the whole project. Not just an employee that does a job and gets paid a wage. We well, probably gets paid a wage as well as benefits through the shareholdings and his development association with Nightcap. Anyway, I didn't want to make this a very long one. I just wanted to point out the ridiculous costings of the latest rendition of civil construction costs and how you can now see that, well, pretty much 10 million is, well, over 10 million is contingency built in in margins and adjustments and other ways on top of the project contingency. Now, in the previous version, the accepted value is not with the contingency. It's 37 million. So here, the accepted value should be 27 million without any con contingencies or marginal adjustments. Marginal adjustments that suddenly appeared as costs that weren't over here. So does that mean that they got better accountants? I would hope so. But even so, building it in and saying that the actual trade cost, that's what they're going to pay. 27.9, not 31, not 39. 27.9.
Now, if you wanted to listen to the results of what's going to go on at the planning meeting, that's Thursday night. You can log on to, um, well, log on to the details from the council's website. Uh, go to council meetings. They give a link. You log on and follow the instructions that they give you there. So you can watch the live meeting yourself, or you can wait for the um, results to come out. I do anticipate that this will go to the Northern Regional Planning Panel, that the issue of this uh, latest rendition of the costings is not going to be looked at. In the, well, in the event that some miracle actually happens and the Northern Regional Planning Panel thinks that it can actually give consent where the State Environmental Planning Policy in many occasions says you can't give it if they don't do this or if they're doing this. So I don't see how any authorising body can give approval for this development application. Knowing the failure of, failure of this development application, how long is it going to take? How long will this keep going before it's realised that the only way that you could get development approval is to completely change everything and then submit a new DA within the time span before the Tweedshire Council remove themselves from the State Environmental Planning Policy? It is only a couple of lines on the schedule itself. They only have to remove a couple of lines and once those lines are removed, rural land sharing communities are prohibited in the Tweed Shire Council and it is no longer governed by the state environmental planning policy. If anyone wants to set up a rural land sharing community, he'll have to go to a different shire. So you're gonna have problems short term or long term you're going to have problems trying to set up any of this as a rural land sharing community and it does need to be asked how long are people going to continue this on this has been going on for five years it will not get approval for over density for destruction of habitat for destruction of heritage sites for taking over water catchment areas where, no, you can't build there because we're going to perhaps build a dam there for the larger community, for drinking water in the future. We need to consider water resources. We are a country of drought, of bushfires, of floods. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity. And city people that haven't experienced the bush you haven't experienced the kind of roads that you would travel up, unsealed roads into this development, you've got a rude awakening. But then I think you may be able to ask some that have already found even getting up their own driveway from a sealed road is enough to cause accidents and badly dent your car. And at least that's all it's done is dent the car. In the wrong conditions, you could kill yourself, your passengers, and any other animals on the road or other people on the road. You cannot control the elements in the rain. When it's heavy rain, it's flooding or in bushfires, you have just got to be able to get out or make the most of it. And you need a car, a vehicle, that can move you from A to B. If it's heavy rain that you're running from, the chances are you're not gonna get up and down dirt, dirt roads. The heavy rain might have actually washed out the road enough that any grip that it did have, now you're just skidding. And there's so much rain coming down that, you, well, no, you're not actually skidding, you're kind of paragliding. The tires aren't making contact with the road as such. They're gliding on the water and the car's getting dragged around by it. And depending on how steep your hill is and uh, whether you can manage to get any grip anywhere, you better hope that there's a tree that will stop you from falling off the edge because if you're going to fall off a cliff, yeah, that's not going to be fun. So yes, there's lots of dangers out there just for human beings on an unsealed road. 
And that was a failure of promise. I'm sorry to say it, guys, but you just didn't live up to what you said. You said 28 million, 28 kilometres, a sealed road that any cars could travel on. And I don't think that's quite the case. Because, forgive me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that say unsealed roads? As the cost increase over here to, now it's not 18 and a half, it's actually 20 million. See up here, um, internal site road network, it's now 20.6, not 18 and a half, so they've added 2 million onto that. Um, is that because you were able to seal the internal roads at a cheaper cost than a million per kilometre? Or did you decide to perhaps only do 20 kilometres at a million? Have you changed the kilometres of road? Don't know. There's no specification on that, is there? Or are we supposed to believe that the, the costing up between what would essentially be two months has gone up two million to do the roads? And the 15% contingency has changed to all these other contingencies added in. So there's, well, at least 10, 11 million dollars worth of contingency that you can add some of that in to the 27.9 to get 31 million. So, ooh, ooh, we're over that. Now we can go to the Northern Regional Planning Panel. Oh, you beauty, because you know what? I think we've got it all sorted out there. I've talked to the people there, and they're happy. They've given me this, you know, tentative assurance and this, that, and the other. Well, this is what Derek Zellman will tell you anyway. He's got it all figured out, that even with this bad report, and even with the fact that the law exists that they can't get around, the non-compliances, well, has he got it all figured out? how all those non-compliances are just going to disappear like some fairy dust <laughs> magic? <laughs> no, sorry. The issues are going to exist as long as their desire to create that concept is the same. They need to change the concept if they want to get any chance at an approval. And that might actually take more time than they can afford because if that means lodging another development application, hmm... That could be a bit tricky because the state environmental planning policy might remove the Tweed Shire Council before the Tweed Shire Council would actually accept its lodgement. And it wouldn't be at Christmas time when people have just come back from holidays after two weeks and it's gone through sneaky and nobody really had time to respond to it. The only thing I can actually say about the amended costings is that it's actually far better presented as far as a breakdown of costs. So why couldn't that have been done in the first place? A quality assessment, well when I say quality, more detailed, it still isn't as detailed as over here when they're actually giving you, um, well I suppose it is further up here when they, sorry, further down where they itemise everything 125 street lights 15,000 each so you go in and it is all itemised so that's the whole cost of what they intend to do in stage one as you can see all the ones that they added in there that they are not going to do they've all been excluded and as they excluded them Let's find those ones that we got, F forgot. 5.4 for the bridges, and uh, where's the lighting up here? 1.8, I mean it's just pumped up and pumped up. Well, it looks like they've put up the cost of uh, the telecommunications too. It's now 1.9 and 973, it was 1.8 and 795,000. So you could actually expect that if you ask them to revise the costings that it will go up by a couple of hundred thousand or maybe a few million will be added in here and there if you ask them to correct anything in this one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, kind of redundant when the cost of it is going to matter nothing if none of it can be built. 
the cost of stage one is not going to be a cost that is borne by the development if they are not given approval. I do not see how they can get approval. And on that note, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Catch you next time. Bye.